scripture today comes from Matthew verses, uh, chapter 26, verses 14 to 29. Then one of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What will you give me if I betray Jesus to you? They paid him thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment, he began to look for an opportunity to betray Jesus. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Where do you want us to make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? Jesus said, Go into the city, a certain man, and say to him, The teacher says, My time is near, and I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus directed them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, Jesus took his place with the twelve, and while they were eating, he said, Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed and began to say to him one after another, Surely not I, Lord. Jesus answered, The one who has dipped his hands into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Humanity goes as it is written, but woe to the one by whom the Son of Humanity is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. He said, You have, <coughs> you have said so. And while they were eating, Jesus took the loaf of bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And then he took the cup, and giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it anew with you in God's dominion. May God have a blessing to this reading you may be seated. I forgot to tell you that on Wednesday we're going to put together our little Easter baskets. And we got lots of supplies over there. So if you're available around 1030, come in many hands to make light work. Those will be going to the uh, children's uh, home, the orphanage, and those in need. So. I only chose a few parts of this scripture. Now, the thing about this this week being Palm Sunday, the scripture is like <laughs> way long. There's lots. Actually, there's there's a couple of gospel readings, um, and they're way long. And so I chose part of the gospel reading, and I hope that um, you will join us on Wednesday because we're going to be going through the rest of the long. Ser a series of scriptures and a special service on Wednesday uh, from uh, doing a dramatic reading. So I invite you to come and participate. So this song, uh, Upon Sunday, um, and the story for this week is like the daytime drama. Even though I hear after 41 years that all my children and my life to live are going to be taken off. <laughs> like those dramas, this is about betrayal. It is about greed. It is about self-serving. Maybe we like to, that's why y'all like to watch those shows. <laughs> but it's also a story about Christ and his ability to forgive. Even the betrayer. It's a story about love. And it's a story about the capacity to love even when you've been betrayed. I always wonder, and when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask, I wonder why, if Jesus knew that Jesus was going to betray him, why on earth would he call him into the inner circle? And matter of fact, why would he put him at the table with him? We know how it plays out in the end, 
and it doesn't end so well for Judas. But Jesus knows that betrayal because he sits with it. And yet he offers bread and wine, the memorial meal. He knows the passion and the beauty, but also the trouble dealing with humanity brings. In other words, we're a lot of trouble, <laughs> even today. And yet, he goes ahead and offers them this holy meal, this opportunity. So, we offer communion every Sunday. Because we know that many people have been turned away from communion tables around the world. And we know because of the many ways in which we have been betrayed by religion. But I want to tell you today, saints, that we have a choice to forgive and to move forward. Sadly, many people struggle for years and years and years and years with the religious damage done from their past. You don't have to do it anymore. I want to tell you that right up front. You don't have to do it anymore because God is not in some box. The choice is really up to you, however. It is up to you. You can either hold on to all that garbage or you can let it go. It is in the unpacking of that hurts and those pains that you will start to see healing. And those hurts and those pains need not hold you hostage any longer. Jesus forgave and reminds us that forgiveness is key to our own healing. Now, I'm not saying that we have to go back into um, some religious closet somewhere or be a doormat. We don't have to live that way anymore. We don't have to hold on to the bondages of our past. You are not alone. Amen? Amen. I think Jesus proved that because he was considered what they call, they, they considered him dangerous. He was a dangerous rabbi. Even though he was popular at this moment in history, one week later the tables will turn. The very people who celebrated his entry into Jerusalem to mark their freedom from slavery in Egypt, who, who yelled out, Hosanna, Hosanna, will yell out, crucify him, crucify him. As Jesus rides <coughs> into the city, saints, <coughs> he represents something more powerful than a thousand legions, he represents hope, yes. even in betrayal. He represents hope. When we say that Jesus died for us, we might miss the full impact of that saying because he didn't just die for us, he was executed. Come on. His death was not warranted and yet his death was on purpose because of what Jesus was doing. Jesus was overcoming evil with justice. <clears throat> overcoming and bringing hope instead of fear. Sharing healing instead of sickness. Jesus courageously kept doing what he was doing, even though he knew it would have fatal consequences. I wonder how we fit in that mold. As people of faith, we experience this hope of Christ, but only if we understand truly the death and the resurrection and the path that was paved. 
we must be willing ourselves to die to the old ways. Oh man, I don't know about you, but we don't like to let go of some of the old ways, amen? Yeah. <laughs> but we must be willing to die to the old ways of being and allow our lives to be um, raised up in new ways. That's an incredible gift that God has given us. The old self must go. And the old way of thinking and acting and of being just doesn't work anymore. Hopefully, as we begin to understand our spiritual selves on this incredible journey, as we under begin to understand our spiritual selves, we can see the depth of God. And not only the depth of God, but the depth of God's love for us. Growing up hurts. And yet, we are not alone in the growing. And we can understand that God is still working. I want to quote a, a quote from Borg who says this. The earliest Christians would have understood that in laying down his own life, Jesus denied the temple's claim to have a monopoly on forgiveness and access to God. Oh, that's just so powerful. God in Jesus has already provided the sacrifice and thus taken care of whatever it is that you think separates you from God. The problem is we think that, the, that we're some kind of special thing that God hasn't already taken care of it. God is taking care of him. The death of Jesus then is this metaphor for what I call radical grace. Trouble and beauty. Indeed, in the face of betrayal. We know that we hold our own troubles. <laughs> we have our own issues <laughs> when it comes to our faith and our faithfulness. When we fall short, we too betray Jesus. But hold on. Hold on. Jesus knows where you've fallen short. And still invites you to the table to join in the feast. Hallelujah. You know... I think of the dividing of Jesus' clothes on that cross. His words from the cross. The sour wine offered to him on a stick. Are these assurances that God is not absent? And it is not the end of Jesus' ministry either. Or of Jesus himself. The resurrection story that we're going to hear next week is implicit in the way that Matthew tells the story. The joy of Palm Sunday increases the horror of the cross. Uh, think about just when you think things are going along really great. <laughs> See, things are coming together to their triumph conclusion. Disaster strikes. Mm -hmm. That's how it is in life. Sometimes when you're just going right along, whoop, and what happens when the whoop happens to you? What do you do? Where's your faithfulness? God has not stopped saints by disaster. God is not stopped by betrayal. God is not stopped by human frailty. God is not stopped by human hatred. God is not stopped by the powers that be. God is not stopped, even when evil seems to be winning. 
God is not absent. God is in the presence of the midst of the disaster. God is in the presence of the sharing of the pain. God is revealed in the suffering. And God will reassure us again and again and again and again that in spite of the power of evil, nothing is stronger than God. Wow, can I get an amen? Amen! amen. Nothing is stronger than God. I think we got to let it sink in here. <laughs> and now the rubber meets the road. Betrayal can happen even to the best of us. We can be the betrayer, or we can be the one being betrayed. It can happen like a thief in the night that comes in to steal your possessions if you're not careful. Being the betrayer can happen innocently enough when you're not paying attention. It can come from your thoughts. It can come from that lamb who's really a wolf in lamb's clothing. All right, all right. It can come when you're upset with your partner because you think they treated you wrong. Mm -hmm. And maybe they did. And yet, you get thoughts like, the grass is greener over there. Saints, I gotta tell you, I assure you, it is not. Amen. <laughs> you think that you want something or someone better. But you're not willing yourself to be better. Come on now. You put up. Marilyn's not sitting here this morning, but I said, You put up with me <laughs> and my stuff. But I don't give you the benefit. Of the same putting up. All right. And maybe making a full on commitment. <clears throat> Betrayal happens to lovers and friends, business partners and companies. Sadly, because people have not fully taken on their part in this relationship commitment. Reality is, it's not fun to be on either side of this coin. Right. We might even be able to, we might even betray ourselves a bit. The, the person being betrayed, of course, can play the victim and act like they have no responsibility in the matter. <laughs> And maybe they acted out or said something negative or pushed your buttons. <laughs> but I want to tell you that usually both parties have responsibility. Amen? Amen. The thing is that you, you can work through this. You can work through this, but you have to be willing to overcome and not cling to the past. Not let the past rise up and bring up something back, oh, back 30 years ago. Okay. You have to be willing to overcome and not cling to the past or use the typical excuses. Well, I've been hurt. <laughs> I have a news flash for everyone. Everyone's been hurt. I grew up with religious abuse. Newsflash, many people have had religious abuse and overcome it. I'm one standing right in front of you. Well, my family's dysfunctional. <laughs> Hello? What family didn't have issues? Even the best of families have issues. You have a choice to betray or not. You see, Jesus, Judas has a choice to take the money or not. 
He had a choice. And he chose money over his friend, over the master, over Jesus. You have responsibility and accountability. And they are in your corner. But what will you do with them? What will you do? See, Jesus knew he was going to be betrayed. And I find it interesting because if we really pay attention, we know when someone is cheating on us. We know when somebody has stabbed us in the back, so to speak. We know. And yet, how many times do we run and hide from the very truth? What we don't know is why. And, and the thing about that is, is we don't know because we don't ask. Maybe something's going on in that person's life that that's the only way they know how to get attention. And if we could just go to them and say, would you like to have a cup of coffee? Would you like to have a cup of coffee? And find out. Maybe they're reaching out to you. Maybe not. But maybe. The chances are, the thing is, we don't know what's going on in the other person's life. Assumptions are really bad. And some of you have assumed some things, probably about me, that are not true. But you forget to ask. You forget to ask. I'm human too. I have feelings. That's right. See, Jesus not only knew, but invited the betrayer to the table. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know it must have been difficult. I know if you ask somebody that has hurt you out for a cup of coffee, that it might not be the easiest thing you've ever had to do. <laughs> But what I do know is that Jesus stayed on his side of the street. And when you go out for a cup of coffee, you need to stay on your side of the street. Because you're not a doormat for anybody. But the point is, is that sometimes God puts us in these precarious situations so that we can bring a message of hope to somebody who's hurting. Because you know what? Hurting people hurt people. Hurting people hurt people. And maybe nobody's ever reached out. And that's all they know. Jesus knew it was difficult. We might know what, if it's difficult. He knew what needed to be done. And you see, he kept his focus. He stayed faithful to the call of ministry. And sometimes what happens with us is that we're called and we know it. And yet all these other things start happening. And so we lose our focus. We lose our focus. And we start blaming other people. We have responsibility and accountability in our corner. Saints, we're invited. We're invited to this holy meal. <laughs> Just like Jesus served them, we too are called to come and partake. We're invited to the table to ask for forgiveness and to share in the healing of being betrayed or being the betrayer. It doesn't matter with God. What matters is that you're willing to change. You're willing to do better. And you're willing to follow this spiritual path that Jesus has called you on. And if you follow this path, I guarantee you, you will get better. So... This morning, I'm going to invite you to take 
a few minutes as I go back and prepare the table. Maybe you've been the betrayer. Maybe you've been betrayed. It doesn't matter. What matters is what you're going to do now. You have an opportunity, just you and God. Just you and God. To come clean. To seek God's forgiveness. To seek God's healing. So I invite you to take a few minutes in silent confession with God.